whatever the mechanism of the shame is, right, in that particular moment, uh, the right thing is to stop. Right? Because the moment you're no longer there, or the moment that you're no longer able to participate, continuing sex becomes, uh, you know, quite horrific in a certain way and horrific on both ends. So stopping is the right thing to do, no doubt about it. But the the strategy here would be to stay connected. Right, so in an ideal world, if you could do that, it would look like you wouldn't actually stop having sex. You would just stop moving and you'd connect through the heart and you'd stay potentially completely unmoving and reconnect till you are back and then continue in some form or fashion. Right. That, that would be the, the way to work with it and unravel that pattern. Right. Because like you said, every time you stop and pull away and push him away, you know, you're, you're reinforcing the shame pattern because now you're ashamed of being ashamed. Right. And you're also not leaving him many options because there's nothing he can do. Right. But if you're willing to say, okay, well, you have a code word or something, right? Potato. <laughs> yeah. When you say potato, everything stops, and he'll go, okay, okay. Right. I'm right here. Look at me. You know, it's going to have to be something like, look at me. You know, breathe, because you're going to stop breathing. Then you could do a little bit of a wiggle, right? You could make sure you stay in your body, and you come back, and maybe you have a dialogue or not. You know? And then when you feel like you've popped out enough, you'll continue. Then it might close back down. It might be a bit tedious, but it's still better than stopping, disconnecting, being done with it. You know? That would be probably the... You know, I mean, it's, it's not about being effective, but it probably would be the shortest and most direct way to handle it. And um, this, this applies to other situations too, right? You should, you should never continue when one partner is closed. Uh, so. But of course, if people would always stop having sex when somebody's closed, there wouldn't be any sex happening. So you have to find your way around that by slowing down, by stopping temporarily by reconnecting and then you'll continue perhaps and you know and perhaps not you know and there's no uh you must do this but since you asked me for a remedy so to speak that's the remedy i've seen work so like you said i mean there's nothing wrong with kicking ass right i mean there's nothing wrong with that and i think that um that's been given such a bad bad rap as a you know, as we talked the other day, but I'm just repeating this because not everybody was here, that um, it's not that uh, you must avoid by all, at all costs all masculine activity in order to have a fulfilling sex life or a great partner. It's, that's bullshit. Yes. <laughs> but, but what you do need to have is fluidity and facility, right? So practice and... and, and uh, the ability to switch back and forth. So the way you get um, as good in the in the pleasure domain as you get in the you know email domain is you practice. So the same way that you practice yoga, I'm assuming fairly regularly, right? You do maybe ten minutes of pleasure practice every day, and that can be just what we did here, where there's no hands or actual stimulation involved, or there, it could be a sexual practice. Right. But that has to be as um, developed as the other stuff. So I, ha I do all kinds of rather you know, wild and varied practices, but I don't um, start working till I've done at least a little bit of nonlinear and pleasure practice, mm -hmm. simply because my, it, it, it revs up my creativity in a certain way. Right? So... Uh, and then I do usually longer stretches at night when I have more time, of course. But what I was going to tell you is when you start practicing these things, you will find that you get conditioned the same way you get conditioned to work. 
Right? So, for instance, when I sit down on the computer, everything in me assumes a certain kind of a energy, right? And I become one focused, and I can go forever, right? Because I, it's all just that. And the same way you can um, train yourself that when you get on the mat or when you whatever you do for pleasure practice, when you enter that space, you kind of drop in creating a very specific kind of environment. You can do it with scent. You can do it with a ritual up front so that your body goes, oh, now we're doing pleasure, right? Oh, now we're doing email. And so with that, with the help of the conditioning, with the help of practice, you have both available. And then you can go back and forth, back and forth, back and forth. Now, Technically speaking, you could have both at the same time, but it's a waste of energy. So what I mean by that is uh, it's not very useful to do emails while feeling incredible pleasure. Right? It's just it's not good use of energy because you're, you're sucking energy that you can't use in the, in the midst of email. However, what you can do is you can have reminders of the things that remind you of the pleasure part around you so you're not going as far into the, you know, the depths of the... Right? So I always have flowers on my, uh, on my desk and I have an altar on my desk. And, and so I have things and I, of course, also have lots of dogs, as some of you know. So there's always... Uh, somebody who wants a little bit of love. And so I can go in and out very quickly and get these little micro hits, is what Steve would call them, of uh, juice, so to speak, in the midst of doing things, doing things, doing things. So I don't get completely lost all the way in the, in the jungle of business. But when business is done, I typically take a very strong break. Right, so even if I go back later, when it's when it's done for the time being, I'll take a break. I close things down. Um, I go somewhere else. I usually go and deal with my animals, which gives me great joy. I might do some practices. I have a bath or whatever, and then I have the other thing accessible, um, and that works fine for me. Meaning. I can have both, but not simultaneously, but they're both available. So I'm not worried that at the end of the day, I don't have the juice. I have the juice on tap, so to speak, like you said. But for that, you have to have practiced the juice as much as you've practiced emails. So I have a specific spot. I do my practices, and essentially when I enter, that takes care of it. And then, like I was saying, I, I mean, I might not be able to, because sometimes you have things, and then sometimes, of course, once your mind calms down a little bit, all the things that you've forgotten pop up, and then you just make some notes, and then it can go away. Yeah. No. But it's very, very doable. Um, but it does require dedication to practicing the thing that you don't do regularly. So it's as available. No. If you see it more in the sense of strongest muscle memory, strongest patterning, strongest um, available habit in the body versus some, you know, uh, categorical decisions about masculine and feminine, it's much easier to stomach because yeah. you know, you're not coming from a deficient place. There's good news and there's bad news. Let's put it this way. <laughs> I'll give you the bad news first. <laughs> the bad news is that men are wired to look for young, fertile, shiny women, right? Because uh, that's with whom you procreate the best. So any man, even in his 80s, is still going to look at, you know, young, shiny things. And the younger and the plumper and the shinier, the better. Now, we've always known that, which is why all beauty products essentially produce shine, right? Uh, glossy this, glossy that, glossy hair, glossy this, because shine denotes health. And so if you have to choose between uh, a woman who's got like gigantic 
pustules of acne and straw, you know, thin, grubby, horrible hair, and a woman who's all shiny and glossy bouncing through the meadows in front of the cave, right? Well, whom are you going to choose for better reproduction? Glossy girl, right? Ideally 14 years old or so. So that's deeply, deeply ingrained, and that's why men watch porn and, you know, all of those kind of things. They're highly visually um, oriented towards health and shine. So hence the superficial way, which is where she, while I was talking about, is the preening and the primping, where you create shine. And of course, all cosmetics are geared towards simulating sexual availability. Right? Red lips, um, red cheeks, right? like glossy hair, breasts displayed. I mean, all of those say, I'm sexually ripe and available. And, you know, there we are. Uh, it's, it's neither here nor there. That's the way it works. However, under, so the, that's the bad news. The good news is that that uh, primping, preening, shine producing mechanism is the facsimile, so to speak, the fake version of light, right? Light coming through a woman's body. Because, of course, the body transmits light. You know, I mean, not, not just esoterically speaking, but uh, phys- you know, physics. You'll see there's you know, le- electromagnetic fields and all kinds of things. And there's areas of the body that particularly are transmitting light. And no surprise there, these are the parts that we adorn. Fingernails, toenails, earlobes. Nose, you know, so breasts, nipples, you know. <laughs> so that, that, those are the areas that, that uh, are particularly light filled. And the skin, of course, you know. And so when you allow your body to feel pleasure and the pleasure spreads like we did today in the practice through your whole body, your body becomes light filled, radiant. Right? And you'll, you'll see in, in old scriptures like the, the, the Vijnana Bharava Tantra, which is, the, which is now, there's a translation that's even called the Radiant Sutras. Right? They talk about the illumined uh, expression of the, of the goddess. Right? And they talk about the radiance because that's the real shine. And that, of course, isn't age-specific. On the contrary most of that that bodily radiance, the shine, is a combination of the heart having been pulverized a few times, broken and somewhat mended, right? Which, which produces a certain kind of a surrender because you realize at some point in your life that shit will go wrong and it will go wrong for every single human being in some form. Nobody's excused from losing people they love, losing jobs, potentially even losing their children. Uh, we all lose our parents if we are lucky and we don't die before our parents, right? But so loss and loss of love and loss of things you hold dear tenderize you in a certain way. They can also shut you down and fuck you up. But for the most part, you see in older women, and I'm saying older, uh, you know, that's relative, anybody who's had a few heartbreaks and had had some life and or maybe had some children, you know, there's a certain kind of, kind of letting go and knowing that you're not really running the show. So that's one aspect, a certain relaxation that produces radiance. And then having life move through your body, you know, having a pleasurably alive, pleasure-filled, life force-filled body is the other thing. And so you often see... Um, women who have a little bit more experience be actually more light-filled than young women. But you wouldn't know because young women are shiny by design, right? And, but often, of course, what also happens is you know that, that the most beautiful women actually don't develop those capacities. And when they age, they're in deep shit because they've never learned how to actually cultivate that beyond the surface. And then at some point the surface kind of goes and they have no resource to become a woman with the depth of the radiance. 
So, you know, and then, of course, also the other aspect around that, you know, that we weren't talking about this morning is that, of course, superficial shine attracts superficial man. Right? And, and so if, you, if you're willing to go with only superficial shine, you'll get superficial man. Because, you know, that's as deep, how deep it goes in, in both parties. And, of course, the more you are actually bringing forth the things that are you, your heart, you know, your beautifully broken, open, vulnerable heart, life moving through your body, you knowing the capabilities of your body, you'll attract much, much deeper partners who can go beyond shiny hair and um, big tits. Right. Yeah, you don't want to emulate them. I mean, meaning when you're at a certain age, there's not, not much you can do. And I mean, I don't know how it is in Australia, but where I live in California, by God, women are trying. <laughs> right? <laughs> and so, yeah, it, it's, it's pretty grotesque when you see... 50, 60 year old women trying to reclaim the youth, right? That's not to say that there isn't certain things that do work, right? But only to a certain point. So you'll have to resource yourself differently. It's not easy, um, certainly nicer when it's all still in place. But that's a sad, you know, there's genetics and good thinking and good eating, but Beyond that, every single woman will age much more severely than men age. And nobody really gives a damn when a man ages, unless he ages very badly. But even then, there's plenty of you know, women who will still go for that if it comes with the status and the power. So it, it's certainly something to find and cultivate over the years before it all goes south. But like, for instance, didn't somebody here study with Angela Farmer? Was it you? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so Angela Farmer, right? I mean, that woman is radiant. Oh, her eyes are so bright, right? And her hair is down to here and the way she moves her body. And, and she's like so magnificent that you never think of her any other way than just deeply embodied and sexy, yeah, Angela Farmer has a love body of, of, of epic proportions. Uh, if you ever want to see somebody who to aspire to, I definitely aspire to be Angela Farmer at 70. Yeah. And she struggled in her 50s. So when I met her the first time, she was probably in her 50s, and she openly talked about struggling, right? how one does, because she was stunningly beautiful as a young woman, right? And then there comes a moment in time where you kind of go, you look in the mirror and you're like, who the fuck is that? And what happened to me, right? And, and she struggled with that as much as anyone. She just moved ahead, right? And just went, fuck it, right? This is, this is all around the same time also that she developed the kind of yoga that she's doing now, which is uh, not surprising, right? And there's, of course, two ways to go, which is to put on a, an, you know, a, a coat, to you know, put on an act, or to feel it from the inside out. And since I developed all the women's practices in the last 13 years, I opted for the inside out. Right? And the same principles that apply to everything we do here uh, apply, which is feel your body, uh, become familiar with sensations, right? sensitize yourself to your sensations, begin feeling pleasure through the body. Don't actually force yourself to do things that your body doesn't want to do, you know, all of those kind of things. I find uh, developing masculine practices equally as important as developing feminine practices because I find it incredibly um, disempowering to to expect from a perfectly sound and healthy and well adjusted um, uh, accomplished woman to squash one part of her right I mean to me that's just wrong because that's like going straight back to the 50s just now with a little bit of spiritual spiritual powdered sugar on the shit right because why would you stop working just so that you're more feminine, 
well, welcome back to the 50s. Uh, it's just a different version of the 50s. And so um, I, I think you can be fully embodied and very powerful and very radiant and still kick ass. Angela Farmer, once again, being a perfect example. And furthermore, she's in a successful relationship with a great man. So there's, evi there's further evidence that you can have it both, and that doesn't necessarily mean you're going to end up with a, a flow boy, mm -hmm. right? Because Victor is no flow boy. Yeah. Oh, she's got an amazing husband, yeah. Uh, I mean, there's nothing flow boyish about that man. And, and so, you know, the, the, the dogma says you kick ass in business, you end up with a wimpy boy. Yeah. yeah. Well, yes, that's true if you don't have the other part. But if you have the other part, you can lay it down for a, a proper man and then pick it back up in business. There's having it and there's showing it. Right? And those are different skills. Having it, developing it, being with it, having it available is one set of skills. Then uh, you're absolutely right. If you have it amply and you just go out without having dealt with the fact that you have it, you're going to be like a little lighthouse attracting every creep, you know, everybody. Because that the problem, of course, is radiance is very magnetic. And, um, you know, it's like... I don't know if you've ever been in a sports bar and there's a TV going and everybody has to look there. Why? It's light. Right? So your light, light's incredibly compelling. Moving light, right? The TV being or the, the phone nowadays being uh, our fake substitute for that. But the, you have to look. You can't help it. So, of course, if you're very radiant, you will attract attention wanted and unwanted. So the key is to have it, to cultivate it, to have it in your body and not have to show it because that could be potentially very dangerous. You, know, you could, um, you know, in the worst case scenario, get assaulted or violated. In the best case scenario, people are just weird and jealous or, or catty if it's women or inappropriate as it's, as it's men. So... You you have you cultivate it, you feel it, you have it in your body, and then you learn how to not show it. Right? And that's a that's a it's a personal exploration because you have to feel the difference between shutting it down and cloaking it, you know, veiling it, not letting it ooze out. And um, in an ideal world, you'll, you'll learn how to have it within you, but it just not, you know, it being, a, you know, like a blackout, your skin being like a blackout curtain. <laughs> no, it doesn't come out other than when you want to, so to speak. Yeah, so it always makes me think, I don't know if you remember this movie, Cocoon, remember that movie? Where they, they were completely light-filled on the inside and then they would take their... their their skins off, their bodies off, and it would just be this super bright light. It would kind of come out through a crack or something. <laughs> and, but that's something you have to explore with. Know exactly what you want and what you don't want and what you allow and what you don't allow. And then those boundaries are the parameters in, within which you display your shine, so to speak, right? your light. Other ways to go is have somebody sit on a balance, like one of those balls, and have them move around. That also articulates the pelvic floor, the big balls, which is why they do that in labor, right? It really does a nice job on the whole pelvic floor. Of course, you can work with jade eggs and stuff like that if you want to get really detailed on it. I mean, this is a whole other, this is a whole other topic, but um, I mean... I personally think everybody should know the different layers of their pelvic floor, but not everybody thinks that, of course, because, of course, there's other uh, considerations like pleasure and facility in those areas and energetic things and all of that. But it's fairly easy for most people um, to learn the different layers um, of the pelvic floor, particularly for women where it's easy because you can intravaginally feel the different rings of the, of the muscles and you can actually learn how to articulate them. 
specifically, which is quite useful because then you can learn what's tense, what isn't, what habitually goes tense when you get frightened or um, sexually shut down or, or things like that. For most men, how they learn about sex is through masturbation, right? I mean, I'd say there's very few men who have been initiated before they masturbate, right? And so masturbation, of course, does not involve an actual human, uh, man or woman, right? It involves a fantasy. Nowadays, it's all porn, but back in your husband's days, it was uh, the Sears catalog or something like that. <laughs> early, early versions of Victoria's Secret or what was what people had available, right? You couldn't get porn that easily as a young boy. Uh, you had, I remember one guy once told me he would masturbate to the drawing on in on the inside of the, his sister's tampon boxes. <laughs> yes. I know. It's a vagina. <laughs> uh, you know. So yeah. Because it's that visual for guys, right? So so what happens is uh, it's, you know, there's a fantasy, there's arousal, and there's ejaculation. Fantasy, arousal, ejaculation. Fantasy, arousal, ejaculation. When you listen to some guys, they used to masturbate three, four, five times a day as 14, 15, 16-year-old boys. So that's quite a nervous system habit pattern that doesn't involve a human, and it certainly doesn't involve the heart because you don't love the tampon box. Right? So... So they get with an actual woman, they're not actually equipped, like just pattern-wise, to open the heart, which is why most guys have to target on a nipple or the ass or whatever, right? Or they have to fantasize because that's what perpetuates the particular cycle that comes with the arousal. And then there's also tension patterns in the body. And, you know, there's, because of course the other thing in that is, I think we talked about this very briefly in the, Maybe not. Um, no, I think we did, right? Because they also have to come quickly and usually hidden, right? Because they're in some closet or there's, you know, their sister is brushing their teeth or something like that. And, you know, quick, 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 because they live at home for the most part. Very few guys uh, learn masturbation by leisurely lighting candles and, you know, <laughs> coating themselves in coconut oil and... <laughs> You know, having the heart open to the great mother or something like that. <laughs> while their warrior brothers are holding space outside or some bullshit <laughs> like that. <laughs> That's usually not how it goes. So, so often when men actually start falling in love and their hearts open, they can't get hard anymore. It's a very common thing. And a lot of women describe having sex with men and they're fantastic till they start getting a certain arousal and then they're gone. And the same thing applies there than it applies to you. You have to have the wherewithal to stop, reconnect the heart till the circuit is reprogrammed that it includes arousal and the heart. I'll see you, but exactly. So you have to reconnect the circuit and that takes time. Well, I think that was true enough when women were chattel, essentially, or courtesans in the best, you know, in the in the best and the worst case, where there wasn't much else happening and their hearts were naturally open and available. Right? I would certainly think that that was true back then, because also back then, and 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 still to a certain degree with everyone in the room, nobody's that young in here. Most women had their first sexual experiences with themselves fantasizing about something they loved, right? And most women have sexual feelings uh, that are not necessarily genitally stimulated with horses or dogs or, you know, fairies or whatever, right? So, So women tend to have a sexual fantasy life that's geared towards the heart, where they love something and then that, you know, that the prince will swoop them up and on the beautiful white horse, you know, some version of that that involves both arousal and the heart. So hence, most women are polled that when their heart opens, they're sexually available. 
and most men are polled to have done a lot of non-heart related stuff where uh, you have to essentially stimulate them sexually and uh, then that opens the heart eventually, right, if, if you're lucky. So I'm sure, I, I, I know that's true when you look at all, it's the same in the tantric scriptures, it's considered, I don't think that's true anymore nowadays because women look at porn and fantasize and stimulate pretty much the way men do these days. And with the advent of uh, vibrators, you have as many heart-disconnected women than men because women tend to not love their vibrators. Some I know do. Um, yeah. but, but you don't have a love relationship with your vibrator. Right? Uh, it's a mechanical thing. You, know, you get off and then that's that. So less and less, as I see it over the years, are women original, like, like you know, fail-safe oriented like that you know? and then there comes things like trauma which is very very prevalent and getting more prevalent I don't know if you've read any of the newest studies but essentially because young boys learn uh, about sex from hardcore porn not regular you know cock in, in whole kind of porn but like you know spinning from the rafters in some double penetration crazy they come to girls with a kind of an attitude and a, and a thing that, that almost automatically traumatizes the girls. You know? And, I mean, there's whole studies now that most 12-year-olds have had extensive oral sex and think nothing of it. Uh, and, I mean, that's, it's, pretty, it's pretty brutal. So, so you have now women more than ever who are going to shut down their heart for the sake of the mechanical doing to get the guy to like them because if they don't do it some other girl you know one grade up um will do it you know together with whatever pole dancing and twerking and you know double anal or something like that and it's like holy mother of god um so uh yeah but i would say in general that's true in specific, I don't think that holds true for many. I know a lot of women who fuck like guys. Yeah. Yeah, that's a dangerous anticipation, right? And one that many women make, right? Where they go, well, you know, eventually he'll come to love me. And uh, so, you know, one way around that, of course, is a very unpopular strategy, which is don't have sex to begin with. <laughs> right, very unpopular strategy, but certainly no man will love you the first time he has sex with you. That's just most men are not built like that. And for men, sex doesn't have the significance it has for women. Most guys, if they're honest, have sex like we try different chocolates. Uh, and so, how for men usually love happens is a combination of familiarity. Uh, you know, the newness being interesting enough to pursue it further and getting to know someone as a human and not as an object. And so, of course, the quicker you have sex with a guy, the more you are an object and the less you are human in, in a certain way. And I know guys who've had enormous amounts of women, you know, for all kinds of reasons, training or, or personal uh, interest. And there isn't a lot, you know. There might be heart in the moment, meaning they might they might be able to feel, and in an ideal world, they're still able to feel and be with the person for who their person are. But that doesn't mean that they love, or even that the oxytocin kicks in, right? For for quite a while. So, one good strategy to ensure that the heart does open is to not have sex to begin with. Well, but <laughs> you know. We've all done the other thing. Yeah. And we've all done the other thing with the uh, foreseeable results. <laughs> yeah, well, not only that, but it's what we, we don't think about it, right? Like you said, I mean, most women at least feel something for the guy that they're wanting to have sex with. And so they don't have the, oh, I don't actually like this guy. Yeah. For the most part, some women go, I don't like this guy, but he's so hot, I'll go, I'm going to fuck him. But for the most part, you go, 
oh, potential. Let me combine with that, right? But that's not true the other way around. No. So it's not a reflection of you being bad or wrong. We've, we've all done it, but you can't expect that what's happening in you is happening over there. No, that's the deadly mistake because it hurts like shit when you've given it up and then the guy just moves on to the next, you know, shiny thing. No. <laughs> Yeah, well, at least on the first couple of dates. And I'm not saying this from a place of being prude, right? I mean, other things happen. Meaning, it can go different ways, but a much better way to ensure that um, there's an actual human humanization between two people is to not immediately fuck, to say it bluntly. Right? Because you're not making love the first time you have sex with a guy. Yeah. Well, the thing is this. Let, 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 let me be very pragmatic here. You having sex without being actually in there is a problem. And I'm not saying this in a you are fucked up and you'll never recover way, but you, you have identified a problem. And so while you've identified a problem, it's a good idea to not perpetuate the problem. That's just, you know, if you break your leg, you're not going to go to dance class, you know? And you're not going to go, well, I'm worried that if I don't go to dance class, it's going to be a problem and I will make a bigger problem out of it. You have to heal your leg. What do you do to heal your leg? You put a cast on. When that bone is, is, is mended, you'll go to physical therapy. So the prudent thing to do here now that you've discovered there's an issue is to go and do some therapy. Somatic experiencing is usually a good thing. Read a few books, move with your body, work with your body. Um, there's you know, low-budget versions to deal with this and there's you know, very expensive versions to deal with this where you bring your mind and your body and your heart together. And then from that place, you start again, knowing that you have to be a bit careful to not give your heart away too much or your body away too much. And when those two things are both there, then you'll know when to say yes and when to say no. But while you're figuring that one out, and that doesn't have to be a long time. It can be a month or two, right? But while you're figuring that one out, I wouldn't do any moves. No. Or any extreme moves. Doesn't mean you shouldn't have sex, but maybe you'll wait. Maybe you'll take it really slow. And when you notice that your mind goes or your body goes, you'll pull it back a bit. Right? It's not a black or white thing, but it's like bringing all the parts of you to the occasion. And that means, you know, when you say pleasure is like death, it's not like death, it just hurts a lot. Right? If your heart's been broken, your body awakening to the pleasure and the desire that you, com that you had in conjunction with somebody who broke your heart is very, very painful. But it's not a death sentence and it's not a life sentence because these things heal and they mend and they go away and uh, the, the thing that broke that broke your heart now 10 years from now isn't going to be the issue that's the really good news yeah. so don't tell yourself that it's not it's just you've had an injury just allow yourself to heal from the injury exactly you don't want to do the cast you want to you want to run a marathon on a broken leg and that can cause permanent crippling if you would run on a broken leg you'd probably make it so that it can't heal properly and when it heals it heals incorrectly you take a little bit of time you know and you take your time and you you feel till your heart feels ready to re-engage and if there's any pain that needs to be dealt with deal with it journal about it read things move your body cry rant rave spit on things kick things whatever it takes right the only trouble is if you lock it all up in your head and well just cut yourself a little bit of slack maybe your bone is still broken so to speak 
a few more months are not going to kill you one way or the other. Uh, just be gentle with yourself. If you tend to rationalize things and go too much in your head, find yourself a therapist. I'm telling you, somatic experiencing is a great way because they deal with the mind and the body. And have somebody point out the ways that you ha go in your head and try not to feel. And then you know, start unraveling your feelings. And then eventually you'll be healed enough that you can engage. You're not doomed. By no means are you doomed. And, you know, we all have at least one of those moments in time where it's so injurious that you don't ever want to do it again. And most of us have moved on. So there's a very good chance that you will be fine. <laughs> a very, very good chance that you will be fine. But pushing yourself and forcing yourself and being mad at yourself is not the way to go. You, know, you have to consider yourself temporarily injured. Well, let's put it this way. You're not handicapped. When somebody breaks their bone, they're not handicapped. They just have an injury. <laughs> right? when, you, when you cut yourself while slicing an onion, you're not handicapped and you're not victimized. You just cut yourself. Right, so there's a big difference there. Nobody, nobody uh, has to, or you don't have to assume that you have permanent injury or that you are victimized because you injured yourself. I mean, yes, the knife victimizes you when you are cutting yourself while cutting an onion, and the evil onion victimized you, but not really, right? And and so the same is true there. So you you sustain the romantic injury doesn't make you a victim. It just means for a moment while it's healing, you don't want to expose yourself to more potential injury. That's all it is. Well, but as far as old sexual trauma goes, you can close the door. But I can guarantee you that by the time you're 35, that door will open. Or 40. You close the door on it mentally... Like you said, you don't let yourself be victimized with it, and you work with your body on releasing any residual trauma you have. Right? With your body. Because you, don't, you can hash it over till the cows are you know, coming home because it doesn't make any difference. It's done. But your body holds memory, and that memory, if it's not dealt with at some point when there's enough cumulative other, you know, happenings, will, it will pop up. You don't have to reprogram it, you just have to release it from your body patterns. Yeah. So, um, so there's other modalities. Like I said, uh, somatic experiencing is a combination of being with the body as it processes and speaking about it enough so you can put it away. But uh, closing the door and suppressing things very rarely works. Well, it works till you're a certain age. <coughs> right? In your 20s, you can still suppress shit very effectively. But in your 30s, you can't because there's too much living that has gone on that makes it so that these things get stirred up. And the worst that can happen is that it gets stirred up uh, at a point where you have low defenses and it kind of takes you over, which happens to people. So I'm not saying this as in to scare you, but... You want to deal with it, but you can deal with it um, in your own time, and you don't have to deal with it now. It's much more um, effective if you let yourself heal enough from the current situation that you can reconnect with men and with yourself and with your own body and with your own uh, pleasure from the last circumstance. But as you've no noticed, whatever this guy did opened the floodgates backwards to the beginning of time, right? And that can happen again any time. So first order of business is stop the bleeding, so to speak, right? Put, put the cast on. Wait till the cast has healed the bone. Do the physical therapy. And then you can go back and look at previous injuries. No. But you want to be mindful and gentle with yourself. And that's not... Uh, the same as 
considering yourself handicapped or damaged because you're clearly not. You have a good head on your shoulders and you know what you're dealing with. But you can't deal with everything at once. You have to just take it bit by bit.